Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook live broadcast. I'm Steve Altitian, Director of Client Partnerships here at Lander Home Family Law. Today, I have Will Jones with me, our lead litigation attorney and managing partner, talk about military divorces and how they differ from regular divorces. So, Will, how are you doing? And would you like to talk about yourself a little bit here? Let us know what's going on with you these days. Sure. My name's William Jones. I'm a partner at Lander Home Law. I've been doing nothing but family law, pretty much. I do some other stuff here and there in Oregon for a little more than a decade. Um, happy to be talking about military divorce. It is a mess. It's really difficult um, for a lot of attorneys to handle. It's much, much different. You're dealing with a whole bunch of federal law. Um, and it took me a very, very long time and a lot of help to actually get up to speed on this stuff. And there's still a ton of attorneys out there who will just turn these away and go, not for me. And there's even more attorneys who take them and need some help. Well, wow. Thank you for having me this today then, because that's it's really important for people to get themselves to the right lawyer for the right issue they have. So before we get into details uh, about the different rules and the, and the different procedures that are involved in military divorces, let's start with a basic question for our folks. What makes a regular divorce a military divorce? What's the definition? I'm, I'm assuming we're not talking about a divorce that's handled by a military judge. So the, the general process of the divorce doesn't necessarily change. There's a lot of different hooks and things that exist um, when you're dealing with DFAS, when you're dealing you know, with service member spouses, when you're dealing with veterans. Um, the factual underpinnings change a lot. The actual process through the court, it's still the state court, still the Oregon Rules of Civil Procedure, still follows that track with a few caveats, uh, service member civil relief acts and things in service and things in timelines change a little bit, but it's the same process. But the pieces that you're dealing with and possibly dividing are drastically different. And why, why is that? Um, there, the reasons behind it, I guess, are that the situations that military members are in are different than a lot of other folks. So, you know, let's start with the rules. Let's start with procedures first. Um, and excuse me for being super basic at this point, but I kind of want to get a groundwork on this. And so let's start with, speaking of groundwork, the grounds for divorce. Are the grounds for a divorce different in a military divorce from a divorce, let's say, in Oregon? Nope, still a no-fault state, still no fault is required. One person wants to get divorced, that's it. That, so that's the same. So what about residency um, and filing requirements? Do those change in the military divorce at all? Now you're getting into where you get into the, some of the tricks um, and some of the confusion here. Um, as we all know, a military service member may be stationed somewhere. Or they're out on orders, and that brings in the Civil Service Member, service member Civil Relief Act, which basically says, hey, hold off on all litigation while this person is under orders, while they're deployed, something like that. Now, that protection can extend up to a year past when the service member leaves the service or is discharged, whichever way it goes. So your timing there changes a lot. So even if you can get a service member served, which is a little more difficult as well, there's a part of the Code of Federal Regulations that actually deals with serving service members. In Oregon, if you serve somebody, they have 30 days to respond. But if they're a service member, that's a whole different thing. Same protections can be held true for a service member spouse. It's actually separate federal legislation that covers spouse. One of the major issues is where do you file these cases when you have, say, someone who's in Sudan, Right, under orders. There's when people sign up for the military, they say, This is my legal residence. Say they came from Oregon and now they're stationed in Texas. Right, their paperwork with the military is going to say, Hey, we pay Oregon taxes on this guy. This guy has his legal residence in Oregon. That's different than their home of record. Home of record for the military determines how much they pay you to move, things like that. But it doesn't tell the military where to pay taxes or where they're subject to service of process. 
So it gets a little strange when you start dealing with someone who is, say, stationed in Texas, but is an Oregon resident, and maybe you have a wife who lives in Washington, right? Is she a Washington resident as far as legal process, or is she a service member spouse who is registered in Oregon? You start to get into some very tricky, confusing issues as to where do you even file these things? That would also, excuse me, my mic is kind of acting up. That would also bring in then, I, I suppose, how, how you serve an active duty person in the military. Um, first of all, what if you can't find them? Um, let's say you've been separated for four or five years and you don't really even necessarily know where they are. You know they are in the military. Um, how do you go about trying to serve them then? That can be a little bit challenging, to say the least. Hopefully you know at least where they're stationed. If you know where they're stationed, usually you can get a, a hold of, well, I guess it depends on what member of the military. But to keep things simple, usually you can just contact their CEO and go, commanding officer, and go, hey, where is this person? How do I get them served? The Code of Federal Regulations is basically going to say, hey, just go ahead and serve the base slash the CO. They'll get it to the person who may actually be out in the field. So it takes a little bit of finagling to kind of figure that stuff out. Um, DFAS, who runs all this stuff, they do a pretty good job of helping you locate service members uh, because obviously they need to be located for kind of other reasons as well. The process of getting a divorce finalized, let's say the service member uh, doesn't answer the, after being served. Um, are there any differences? Generally, you can go about and just you know, go to the judge and say, I want to default. Does that change at all when it comes to military members? It, it changes a lot. So even in the stuff that we do here when we take a default, there's actually a paragraph that we're required to put in there that says this person is not an active member of the armed forces, right? That's that Service Member Civil Relief Act coming kind of to light even when you're not dealing with a service member because that protects from default anybody who's active duty in the military. So you got to take some special precautions if you think you're going to get a default to go, this person's in, but he's not active duty. Kind of depends on your situation there a little bit. But defaulting a service member is exceedingly difficult and generally just not advised because it's very easy to set aside a default when you're dealing with a service member. That makes some sense. They may be, you know, in active duty, they may be deployed, there may be a lot of valid reasons why they really can't necessarily answer at that point. So, Beyond just the procedural issues, the serving, you know, the getting of the, uh, the person served, the, the filing for a default, those kinds of things, the deciding where you want to file, going past that to the substantive issues. Let's, let's start with division of assets. Um, is the division of assets different in a military divorce um, and does that apply to all of the assets or is it just some of them? The division itself, right, the functional, say, percentages, if we're dealing with it that way, that's not necessarily different, right? The part that's different is how you go about the division, right? So the state court is going to say, hey, look, you get 50% of this, you get 50% of that. Well, you might be dividing, say, a military pension. That's federal, right? So now you're talking about a state court telling federal people what to do, which conceptually can't happen in most situations. So as you deal with those concepts, you have to start going, hey, how do I divide federal benefits in some way that the state court can have control over? So the percentages don't change. The method of division changes a lot. And there's a ton of pitfalls as you start dealing with the actual functional division. Are there some assets that are treated differently under military or federal law? I, I've, I've heard the pensions are a, a kind of a different animal. 
Yeah, pensions, so military pensions, let's kind of define what those are. Um, a military pension itself is very similar to a lot of other pensions. Almost all military members now are on what's called a high three where when they retire, we look at their highest three years of average base pay, and then you get a percentage of that. So you average out three years, then you get a percentage. That percentage is determined by active duty. For every year of active duty, a military member gets 2.5% of their high three years of base pay, if you're following that math. The trick, if you want to call it a trick, is that that doesn't vest until they have 20 years of active duty. Right at 20 years times 2.5 percent, that's 50 percent of their base pay. If a military member is discharged at year 19 and a half, if they leave the military, anything like that, their pension is gone, never existed, it never vested. So when you're looking at dividing some of these things, say you got a service member who's been in for 19 years, right, and you're going to divide the pension, the pension doesn't exist because it hasn't vested. Now functionally for my practice and for what most people should be doing, you can still divide that, but the non-member spouse is taking a risk that it never comes to fruition, right? Yeah. So that's just one piece. As you continue to deal with the pension, and usually the pension is the largest piece of any, because you end up with a, say, 39-year-old who could have 20 years in, now from 39 until they pass away, Mortality table says they'll die about 79. So they got 40 years of getting half of their base pay every month for the rest of their life, right? And they may have lifetime health insurance through TRICARE. So huge amounts of money are usually contained within the military pension. The trick for the non-service member spouse is making sure that they can get that. So here's where one of the hugest pitfalls, malpractice all over the place comes. Say a service member is getting $2,000 a month in military pension. What any service member wants financially, not physically, is to become disabled. Disability pay is a credit dollar for dollar against the pension. So if you have someone who had a military pension, $2,000 a month, that is now 100% disabled or classified as 100% disabled, their military pension pay is gone. It's replaced by 100% disability pay. Disability pay is not taxable. The pension was. Disability pay isn't. Here's where the huge piece of malpractice happens. Say you divide that $2,000 a month in half, right? $1,000 to non-service member, $1,000 to service member. Service member goes out and gets a disability classification of 100%. All that pension, it's a dollar for dollar credit, is gone because now it's disability pay. Now the service member is getting all of that disability pay. The non-service member is getting nothing because you cannot divide disability pay. You cannot. So then you're in this practice area where you're going, how do I secure something that can be replaced by disability? If you don't, your non-service member just got nothing because this person ended up with a disability designation. You follow me on that one? Oh, it's... yeah. That sounds like something really easy to screw up if you're, you know, trying to advise your client and you, you haven't had the experience in a military divorce because that's just not something that, that most people would normally think about even. Well, in Oregon, say you have a, a government employee, you have perks, right? Still a pension, operates in much the same way, right? You still you know, gain years of service, it works much, much the same. But when you divide PERS, PERS creates a whole separate account for the non-participating person. Now that's theirs, the other person can't touch it at all. And there is no disability credit in PERS. So you take attorneys who have been doing this for a long time and it's their first military case, how would they even know to look for that? Yeah. Why would you look for that? Because, hey, I've divided a, who knows how many pensions in my career. This one is the different one. Where did that come from? Is, is this the same for all uh, forms of the military? Um, are these the same rules that apply if someone's in the Army or the Navy or the Coast Guard? Um, or do they have even 
some separate roles themselves on top of that? The basic functionality doesn't change, right? There are different sections of the federal code for Army, Navy, Marines, et cetera, but retirement for the most part is pretty consistent of, across the board. Right. right. So the other piece that, that people need to be very wary of as well is the spousal benefit plan, right? It's an amazing program. It works unbelievably well. And what it says is if you purchase, because you have to buy it out of your retirement pay, if you purchase the spousal benefit plan, when the service member passes, the non-service member gets 55% of the total pension payment for as long as they live, right? And it's wow. something you have to buy. So it comes out of the retirement pay. It's based on, you know, kind of what the pension amount is. But without that, the service member passes. Now the non-service member has a problem, right? Because of the way that pension works overall. So you got to be really wary of that. And in the judgment, which is what closes the case out, you need to reconfirm that in the judgment. If you don't have that, service member dies, you've created a large problem for hopefully not your client, but <laughs> it could be your client. We just didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so let, now let's turn to child support, spousal support, um, military pay. They're all sort of intertwined. And are there special considerations regarding those issues that are unique to military divorces? Yeah. So this one's a little bit tricky. So a service member without dependents is required to live on base, right? So no dependents, you're required to live on base, say commissary, get your meals there. That's kind of the way that that works. When you have dependents, now you don't have to live on base. You still can, but you don't have to. When you have dependents, the military is going to pay you BAH, basic assistance for housing, which is on top of your base pay. That allows you to live off base, buy groceries, all that stuff. One of the things that you see every now and then when you do a bunch of these cases is opposing attorney who looks at the service member and goes, oh, you have $3,000 in base pay and another $1,500 in this entitlement. Well, when the divorce is complete, no more living with dependents, no more BAH. And what a lot of people want to do is count that as, as income. It's not income as soon as that divorce judgment is done. So that's a huge pitfall. And the one I've argued many, many times uh, because I have someone on the other side who just doesn't know that. They look at it and go, well, it's income. We have to count all the income and it's here now. So, but it won't be <laughs> as soon as we sign this thing. Also, there's an entitlement to BAH for the non-service member while the disillusion is pending or even before, because it's meant to support them as well. And usually a call to the CO and the service member to go, hey, there's no support happening here. We'll redirect some of that BAH to the non-service member. Now, child and spousal support, the rules that govern those, they don't change because we have a service member. What does change a lot is parenting time because now you have one parent who's a service member who might be on orders over here, orders over there, now they're overseas, now they're stationed here. So parenting time becomes somewhat difficult because they don't know where they're going to be and neither do we. And is it going to be appropriate? So a lot of times you see parenting plans in some of these cases where it's when I'm on leave, we'll do this. And that's really kind of the best you can do. Are there kinds of things also I guess known to the judges very well because especially when you're talking about going back to some of the support issues when you you know in Oregon you fill out a child support form and um, you know it says what you know what's your income and if someone lists their their housing as income while they're because they actually have it they um, just does a judge know necessarily, oh, you need to make sure you take that out or, or is that something you as an attorney better make sure that you put in front of the judge? Oh, everyone who sits on the bench in Oregon is a perfect person and an absolute genius. Um, <laughs> it's something that as an attorney, you want to make sure is unbelievably clear because, you know, judges come and go. There's some judges who have been on the bench for 20, 30 years and have heard this all the time. Uh, there's other judges who it's their first year. So it's something you definitely want to make super clear and you want to have the law and facts to back it up. 
Um, it's not something you want to just assume that people know because it's a different world out there. It's something very specific. And if you have a judge who's never heard this stuff before, you just don't know. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a list of the issues that judges have heard in their career. Now, there's some judges that I've appeared in front of on this issue. Maybe I don't need to explain it that much. But you look at some place like Clackamas County, they revolve judges, so you don't know who you're going to have until the day before. So you better be prepared to explain some of this stuff. That makes sense. <clears throat> then the um, go on on child support again. Is there is there a vehicle inside military rules uh, separate from let's say what a judge might order when it comes to uh, supporting their children? Um, can you, I, I've heard that there, that, that you can go directly to, for instance, a, a, a superior officer maybe of, of your spouse and say this, I'm not getting support, don't have a, I'm trying to get it to the judge, don't have it yet. Is there anything that you can do directly with the military in those kinds of cases? Yeah, most definitely. That's when a portion of that BAH, because there's an entitlement to the non-service member because some of that BAH is meant to support the dependent. So yeah, there's a vehicle to be able to get that done. And usually the way that we do this, we just contact their CO and it tends to work itself out that way. Right. If, if the person you're talking to, or you're not talking to, the person that, that you're getting divorced from has a child support obligation and is not paying it, I know in, in a lot of states in Oregon, you can, you can go to an, you know, a Oregon agency would go to the employer. You can do a, have a garnishment put on that person. Is does that change at all by the fact that their their employer is the military? Not necessarily. The only time that you're really going to see a very significant difference in that is when it's disability disability pay because disability pay is non divisible. So if you have someone who's 100% disabled and receiving only disability pay. Now you got to do something else because you're not going to get that from DFAT, right? It can't come from there because they can't divide it. We talked a little bit about child custody. I kind of want to get back to that just a little bit. And you know, the fact that a, a military member may be uh, on active duty, moving around a lot, etc. Is that a determination of that that goes into who has custody? Um, is that something that that can I would say penalize someone who's in the military for that? Yeah, is really the answer to that. Although not in, in not necessarily in a negative way. So any case that comes in that has custody and parenting time, I tell everybody the same thing. The only fact that it doesn't ever bend in a custody and parenting time case is what are people's schedules, right? That's the only thing that I can tell you is going to make a huge difference because everything else is on balance, right? This person takes longer showers, well, that person drives too fast, right? Which one of those is better? And that's the difficulty in custody and parenting time. But when you're talking about schedules, I'll tell you, it's the same adage that I've been told for years. Judges understand the need for daycare, but they don't like it. So if you have a willing parent that's available and can do it, who has some capability, why wouldn't we put the kids with the parent instead of putting them in daycare? And that's the problem for a service member. If they're getting bounced around the country, the kids are going to get bounced around too, but they're not available to care for the children. If the non-service member is available and capable of doing it, we're just going to give the service member a daycare bill and put the kid with strangers. That just doesn't happen very often. There are some cases where you have the non-service member who isn't capable of taking care of children. Now we have some things we need to deal with and some things to work out. And some service members just are like, look, I'm going to have to leave the military because you know I was relying on this person and now that person has a traumatic brain injury. And take care of our kids, so here I go. Fascinating. Did you, if if a person comes into you and, and let's say they are 
we start with they are the, the military member and they are they say hey i'm contemplating maybe getting a divorce um general advice not you know not me on their specific case but general advice of of preparing for that um are there are some kind of tips to just prepare yourself as a military member uh, for getting a divorce because a lot of these issues are going to come up and, and maybe some of them can be can be dealt with at least it helps to prepare get get ahead of the curve a little bit so if i'm on the service member side the big questions i want to know how long have you been in the service and how long have you been married right those are two key components those are key components in almost any divorce but very very strictly looked at by the fed overall have we met the 10 and 10 rule or are we at 2020 right 10 years in 10 years married and they overlap 20 and 20. 10 and 10 means that the non-service member can be paid directly from dfas 2020 now the non-service member has free lifetime health health care right so those are two major components because obviously free lifetime health care that's a great deal overall. The next piece that I need to talk with a service member about is we're gonna divide your pension or we're gonna to have to offset it with something else. And you would be shocked at how many people go, no, we're not gonna do that. And I go, that's the law. There's nothing I can do about that. Unless they're gonna walk away from it, but they almost never do. This is gonna be divided. And to some service members, they just never thought about it. And I've had service members in my office going, I got shot at for it, it's mine, no one's ever gonna touch it. Unfortunately, they are, right? And that's just the way that's gonna work. Um, continuing to support your spouse even when you're separated unless they have means for their own support. Um, and when I say means for their own support, that's not, well, they could. No, do they right now or have they? Because one thing judges hate is that financial control, right? Let's keep everybody afloat we'll figure it out as long as everybody's floating. If you go to court and say, wife's at home with the kids with no money and can't pay the rent and can't buy the kids groceries because the service member isn't giving them anything, that judge is going to have a heyday with that service member and go, no, 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 no. And you're not gonna like the outcome of that case very much. So continue to support your spouse. Let's get you through this. We wanna get you done as quickly as possible because as time passes, they're getting more entitlement to more things and you're losing more things overall. Moving just to the concept of, uh, of um, changing a decree, of uh, maybe amending a decree because of a change of circumstances, um, are things like um, where you're deployed, um, Maybe you've stopped being deployed uh, or you've gone into a reserve status or are, are, are there issues that people should be aware of not or it's, is it pretty much just like the divorce issues again when you're actually trying to amend a decree either parenting time or custody or support. So, and just to be clear when you're modifying some manner of judgment right custody parenting time child support. You can't amend property division, right? It's closed when that judgment is done. So we can't go back and reallocate more pension because now he's gotten it, right? Custody, parenting time, and child support, that generally tracks Oregon law. So parenting time, anytime it's in the best interest of the kids. Custody, whenever there's been a substantial change and it's in the best interest of the kids. Child support, whenever there's been an unanticipated change in financial circumstances. Spousal support's a little more difficult. Um, kind of depending on what variety of spousal support, but it is modifiable, assuming it hasn't terminated, because you can't modify spousal support once spousal support is over, because you're not modifying it, now you have to recreate it, and that's not allowed, generally. There are a couple weird hooks in there where it can happen, but super rare. So being a service member, other than maybe some jurisdictional issue, um, they've moved here, you know, this person no longer resides in Oregon, those things can happen. Other than that, it pretty much tracks Oregon law. Okay. The, this is really, really great information. I guess the last question I have is, does, do these rules change depending on the status 
of the military member and the service member? Um, do they have to be deployed? Do they have to be active duty? Um, does that make a difference? It can make a difference when you're talking about service and when you're talking about maybe taking a default judgment or when you can require them to appear in court, right? Because the state court doesn't have the ability to override their orders to pull them in, right? So if they're deployed, the state court can't say you're undeployed. Um, military doesn't like that, so they don't let that happen. Um, so some timing issues, yes. Um, structurally, yeah, it can cause delays, it can cause problems. Um, but still, it tracks the same way. So, that's, it's been just a lot of information, a lot of great information. Um, is there anything we haven't hit that you'd like to talk about? Uh, any, any issues we, we, I haven't asked about? Um, not necessarily. Um, one thing that kind of deals with child support is uh, TRICARE, so military insurance. Uh, dependents qualify for that. So in your child support calculation, obviously there's no cost for that and the military member will be required to continue to provide that. Um, I think up until 21, maybe 23, I'd have to relook as far as where TRICARE stops. Um, for non-member spouses, there are some health insurance options similar to COBRA if they haven't met the 2020 rule. Um, so there's some kind of weird hooks in there. Um, also, when you're looking at a leave and earning statement, an LES, that's basically a pay stub for a military member. Um, there may be things like hazard pay, uh, depending on where they're deployed to. Um, and you need to kind of look at their status to see if that's going to stay there. Um, so there's a lot of very small, very, very detailed hooks um, that you really have to be super familiar with this stuff because say you got you know, somebody doesn't meet the 2020 rule for health insurance, but they're 2019. Well, at 19 years, they're gonna get another year of track. They're not gonna get lifetime of track here. They're gonna need another year. And then they may qualify for that COBRA protection until they can find something else. So hyper detailed area of law, very, very easy to screw up if you've never seen it before. Um, if you're a military member or a spouse of a military member, talk to somebody about this stuff. I can't envision anybody trying to do this on their own. Um, there's lots of great resources out there. There's lots of stuff online. And I've done lots of consults where I go, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. I know you read that online. I understand that. But we got to peel this back and here's how it's going to work. Um, just a ton of information. I'm sorry it's coming out of my mouth so fast. Uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting something because there's a lot to do here. So. Oh. It's a, it's a lot of a lot of stuff and and I mean there's just your talking brings to mind I mean there's there's a lot of nuance in it someone may come to you and they're at 19 years and six months and they've been separated for a long time and you know it's you know when you file can even become an issue mm -hmm. so thank you Will for being here today um, really great gave us a look into military divorces and like you said they're just unique differences and they're unique proceedings and the absolute need to have counsel that understands what's going on um it's great to have someone to talk to about that and who understands those differences and so also thank you everyone for joining us today uh, if anyone has any further questions at all on today's topic, you can post it here on Facebook Live, or you can shoot me an email at steve at landerhomelaw.com. We can get you contacted with Will. And other than that, everyone, again, crazy times. So stay safe, stay healthy, have a great day. See you next time.